Greetings, my fellow Freedom Lord Sovereign Thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Mangroves, South Florida. And today's date, Friday, May 26, 2017. Yes, I'd like to wish a couple friends of mine I knew for a good period of time, close to 30 years, Kevin Wolhaff and Scott Sheffield. Enjoy your holidays to the fullest, my friends. And um, even though I haven't talked, I still think about you guys. And it's great. You're doing well. Blessings, okay? And I am trans being at CJ's Travel Lounge, located at 400 Southwest First Avenue, along the New River of Fort Lauderdale. And mainly at the Southwest area section of near the Andrews Avenue Bridge. Right across here from the jail, Boubier Park, and all that. Yeah, so, um, some of the stuff is still dragging. It looks like there's more drama going on with the Manchester bombing and North Korea, then they want to attack Iran, and it's like, you know, there are all these scumbags in the front line, as far as I'm concerned. Bunch of tough guys. <laughs> Probably could never. Couldn't even make it as bellboy in ranks. And I'd like to wish everyone a safe Memorial Day weekend. Not the whole goes out to go out and party and so forth. However, pay homage to the ones that uh, fought and served for an honorable cause. From the very beginning, even through the so-called Civil War, which I call it the illegal war against the Confederate States of America. I'm from Brooklyn originally, so as a Yankee Northern boy myself, I can say that. Pay tribute to them as well, to the fallen ones, for principles. Yeah, so um, it's going to be, I'm not going to do too many things, going to be ranting a lot, it sounds like. Just got up a little bit late, but I've uh, seen some friends at Churchill's last night, did the Hernandez uh, benefit show. Their uh, house was engulfed in flames. Didn't really have anything, so go, good bands played out there. Soros, Necromaniac, Riot Agents, and their uh, Double Barrel Justice. Entertaining if you're that hard stuff. Punk rock, too. And it was nice to see that and pay a toast to our brother as well that uh, from Rugged Edge. Well, um, all right, so enough of that. Let's just check, I was like going through some of the emails and all that and decide, if, you know, which can pick my brain. And I said, why not? This one came from The Verdict, legal analysis and commentary from Justia. Good site, by the way, justia.com. If you know about cases and so forth, they're, they're very meritable. This, this one here is called Predicting Donald Trump's Presidency. Yeah, I think the reason why I want to be narrating this is because everyone still has this Trump, anti-Trump fetish. Trump this, Trump that. He's the worst president ever. And even the predecessors that try to defend him, Pat, you know, I just start laughing. It's like all oh, this dog and pony show. However, it's an uh, interesting little synopsis here. It says here, Predicting Donald Trump's Presidency by John Dean. The late political scientist and presidential scholar James David Barber believed that character determined how the occupant of the American presidency would perform in the job, and that psychology provided a predictive tool regarding performance in that high office. The Duke University professor developed his classification system for presidents based on their world events and personal interaction with their work. I became aware of Barber's work because of his startlingly prescient analysis of Richard Nixon, who he predicted would have great difficulty by the second term as president. Starting with George W. Bush's second term in a column I wrote dated May 24, 2014, I began looking at presidents through Barber's cataloging of presidents with stunning results. I applied Barber's system again with Barack Obama for a, a November 14, 2008 column with similar revealing results. Now that Donald Trump has passed the 100-day mark in his presidency, there is a solid base of information 
upon which to employ Barber's tape type analysis to predict his performance during his presidency. Professor Barber first published his system in 1972 in the presidential character, predicting performance in the White House, updating it in 1977, 1985, and 1992. The study addressed the presidents through George H.W. Bush. The book was written to give voters tools to examine presidential candidates for insights about how they would perform if elected, but understand how candidates might do in the Oval Office has only interest voters after they made their decision. The presidential character shows that based on history, presidents can be grouped in four psychological categories, which Barber labeled as positive, active positive, active negative, passive positive, and passive negative. More specifically, and I, as I have explained in the prior columns, broad explanations only provide a cure, crude understanding of Barber's designation, while his work provides historical explanations. Barber groups present based on the similarity of their personalities and character traits. His first baseline is to describe them as either active or passive regarding their work, this he determines by looking at how much energy they invest in the work of the presidency. For example, Lyndon Johnson was a human dynamo. Calvin Coolidge slept 11 hours every night and took naps during the day. The second baseline is how presidents react toward their work, positively or negatively. Generally, he determines whether their political experiences are satisfying to quote Barber. The idea is this, is he someone who on the surfaces we can see gives forth the feeling that he has fun in political life. To draw and quote paraphrase from my prior sum summaries, but not in the same order. Active positive types only types not only dive into politics and government with gusto becoming whirlwinds of activity, but they truly enjoy doing it. As Barber explains, these are people with relatively high esteem who have enjoyed success in their political careers before arriving in the White House. They are people who sees productiveness as a value and adopt styles that are flexible, adaptive, and suiting the dance to the music. Barber reports that Thomas Jefferson was our first active positive president, a child of the Enlightenment. He applies his reasoning skills to organizing the new government accordingly. He was a man of wide interest, a life of humor, and astute political judgment. Barber notes, Barber says surprisingly little about Abraham Lincoln, but he appears to be the first of several great presidents who are active, positive types. Other active, positive presidents Barber names are Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, Jimmy Carter, and by my analyst, Barack Obama. Active negative. I will return to active negative presence, but they often take bold moves. And his group includes presence like John Adams, Woodrow Wilson, Herbert Hoover, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and George W. Bush. Those in the groups that have an end proven themselves to be disasters of varying degrees. Passive positive. Barber describes passive positive presence as receptive complaint. Other directed personalities with those in a search for affection as a reward for being agreeable and cooperative rather than personally assertive. They have superficially optimistic and hopeful attitudes to help dispel doubts and lift spirits. They are able to saw often, too often, the harsh edge of politics. Barber places the following presidents in this category. James Madison, William Howard Taft. Warren G. Harding, and Ronald Reagan. These are all presidents Americans have loved when they have been in office and they get by, but by the end of the day, they cannot boast great accomplishments arising out of their presidencies. And we can go here. The, the category of passive negative presence is very odd for my ask why such a person would even become involved in politics in the first place when they don't like it and do little when in office. Barber explains that passive negative types are in politics because they think they ought to be. And once they're in the political spotlight, they are not great leaders, for they tend to withdraw and avoid conflict. 
Barber class, Barber's classic example of this type of president is George Washington, who took the job because he felt he should. Washington was not an innovator. Rather, he sought to create stability and had to be persuaded to stay for a second term, when in truth he would prefer to retire to Mount Vernon. For others from Barber places among passive negative type are Calvin Coolidge and Dwight Eisenhower. Donald Trump is an active negative. In fact, if he's a stronger version of this than all who, whom Barber collected during his analysis and more so, so than George W. Bush, whom I found, found fell into this group, there could be no doubt that Trump's being active. He is literally on the job 24-7 when not in his office or making an official trip. He's on the telephone or tweeting related to his work as president. He's a workaholic. See E.G. Times Magazine after uh, Time Magazine account Trump after hours. Nor is there any question of his being negative under Barber's test. Trump can force his mouth with the camera, but he never laughs, particular, particularly as himself. His Twitter account reveals a man constantly complaining or whining about almost everything. His only enjoyment in the job is that it feeds his inestimable narcissistic appetite for attention, which is not the type of positive reinforcement and emotional rewarding Barber describes to be an active positive. Listen to Barber's description of the active negative. The active negative type is in the first place much taken up with self-concern. His attention keeps returning to himself his problems. How is he how is he doing as if we were forever watching himself? The character of what attention is primarily evaluate with respect to, to power. I am winning or losing, gaining or failing. Barber adds, the active negative lives in a dangerous world, a world not only threatened in a definite way. Also, highly uncertain, a world one can cope with only by maintaining a tense, very readiness for danger. The prime threat is other people. He tends to divide humanity into the weak and the grasping, although he may also, with no feeling of inconsistency, analyze the people in a romantic way. In struggling to understand social casualty, he restricts the explanations to conspiracy or chaos fluctuating between images of tight, seeking control, and images of utter disorder. He strives to resolve decisional conflicts by invoking abstract principles in order to render manageable a too complex reality. Trump is an act of negative for warns of trouble. First look at his predecessors, active negatives, Wilson, Lyndon Johnson, Nixon, and Bush II. These are failed presidencies. If there is one lesson from Barber's work is to do not put active negatives in the White House. Since that has happened, the next lesson is prepare for trouble. Interestingly, the American people understand we have a disaster in the White House with Trump. His approval ratings have been in tank since his first day in office. At the one-day mark of the presidency of Donald Trump, the Cornyapak poll asked Americans for one word they felt best describe the new president. Four leading words ranked in order are as stunning as they are accurate, idiot, incompetent, liar, and unqualified. Most Americans and most of the world have figured out the Trump presidency, and they are braced for the worst. It may end with the 2020 election, if not sooner. Barber did not have to deal with a lying, unqualified, and competent idiot who was an active, ne um, active negative, but he surely find we are in a dangerous place. Pretty interesting here what his, on his statement. And I'm not going to, you know, we always got to look at the pros and cons as well. And I noticed, too, what's unattractive on President Trump is his rhetoric. And that's why a lot of people, like, wig out on him. And many people, if you understand the one world order, you could um, figure people out really damn quick.
status quo continues. But like I said before, if everything if everything goes to crap, like a la economic collapse, if if the folks gonna point the finger at him, then you be duped. But on the other hand, it has its merits on his character. So you have to look at everything into a bigger picture. As I decide when I when I've read this. And it's interesting too, other past presidents. I don't know why he used Lincoln as a positive. I'm like a little bit dumbfounded. I think I would say this about Lincoln. Maybe he did he was his little corn hair positive, active. Right? Let me look at her hair. Staying like, you know, because he saved the Union. But however, how it was done, it was very uh, tyrannical and conscripting other states to come back or else because like I said before if he's like he was caught in the middle of the areas and you know interest free money he used greenbacks which I will say that that was the right thing to do but um, even Lincoln himself had a lot of insane edges rough edges so um, they gotta always see things you know a lot greater when they say he was a great president who are active positive types. You know, and based on what I what I read, I have to disagree in those areas. And of course he was probably caught in the middle, you know, if you look at the banksters wars and all that, which that conflict would say they're claiming the Rothschilds are funny both sides. The same uh, allegations. And uh, freeing the slaves and so forth, which he he believed he, he should go back to Africa. So um but you know on that side I see I, that's how I, I see that. So a lot, a lot of it's pretty accurate when you when you when you examine these when you examine this uh, analysis, but um, but like I said, with Trump himself, many some people call him a man child, man child attributes, and that's why it doesn't matter who's in there, folks. We have to remain vigilant. Period. If you, and too many folks. Try to go to Washington D.C. Look for Lord and Savior. That's the mistake people make. When that's why I always I tell folks time again, you want to make things happen, preserve your liberty, exercise it, plant a seed, not a new tree. In other words, fix the local government, then it will go to the state, then the feds. Start. From the bottom, not the top. But in other words, I gotta say this is a decent synop- uh, analyst, you know, synopsis of uh, Donald Trump. You gotta make your own decisions, my friends, but always prepare yourselves and always remain vigilant, regardless who's in there. All right, next one. Came out yesterday by John Rappaport. Says here, peace through mutual blackmail. Is this, is that what's happening in Washington? And it says here, in just the last few days, the campaign to impeach Donald Trump has quieted down. We'll see what happens, but this is breathing space and pause the result of a stalemate. Do both sides have control files of each other? Is the underlying proposition, I won't spill your secrets if you won't spill mine? Now I refer to an article about Trump and his enemies it has been circulating online it's by jerryperonell.com slash chaosmenar. I don't know who this author is. His views and opinions make an interesting circumstantial case. He, here's an excerpt. James Coney is a poisonous snake of the highest order. A deep water swamp des- denizen who has been highly paid to deliberately provide, deliberately provide cover for a higher level cor- of cor- corruption by the Clinton and the Obama. He has been central to trying to destroy the Trump campaign and then the Trump administration from the start. He is a dirty as they come in D.C. He had the highest level cover, the FBI no less, and was deep into an effort to eliminate Trump. Trump had to move hard, fast, and exactly the right time to call off the head of the snake without getting, getting bitten by the snake or being finished by the other swamp 
that then he's in. Begin by noticing how the president fired Comey when Comey was 3,000 miles away from his office. That Comey has no inkling he was being cut. That all his files, computers, and everything in his office were seized by his boss Sessions and the Justice Department. This was not a violation of protocol. It was tactical. Notice how Pres Trump commendalized the strike and did not inform any of his White House staff to prevent leaks. Notice how he escumulated Comey and the swamp's denizens, 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 denizens by letting them know in a tweet that the Attorney General got information surveillance tapes from the seizure of Comey's office. So Comey's handlers know that Trump's DOJ has the goods on them. This was a brilliant, strategic, and totally imperative move at exactly the right time against the horrible, evil, and corrupt powers infesting our government. The swamp is on notice that the president is on to them. They are sweating bullets because their criminal games of corruption are being pursued, and they know it. They are screaming and ranting because they are desperate denizens of the swamp who are beginning to realize they are roadkill. The article goes on to describe the purported deaths of Comey's corrupt connections to the Clintons and the Clinton Foundation as their agent. In the author's view, Trump and Attorney General Sessions have good on the Clintons now, and they are also, they'll also have damning evidence of crimes committed by other key players in the D.C. swamp. There is another possibility. Given Donald Trump's history as a real estate hustler from way back, his aerobatic financial dealings with money men, his projects, bankruptcies, and celebrity status, and his impulsive proclivities, his extraordinary self-promotion is obvious. His enemies have compiled a control file on him. They have the sort of information they believe they can use as serious blackmail. In that case, we could now be looking at a, at a stalemate of sorts. Both sides have the goods on each other. There is no guarantee of a permanent peace based on mutually asserted assured destruction. But MAD could form the basis of a truce, and the truce could extend into the future. I have your secrets, you have mine, and let's do business. Of course, we have to remember that Washington is a tinderbox at all times. It is a dry forest waiting for a match to be struck and a spark to fly. We will see whether Trump drains the swamp, the swamp drains him, or nobody drains anybody. The present war in Washington isn't for the faint of heart or the nice people. They want everybody to get along or the submarines who want all participants to be awarded trophies. Washington is crime central and the knives are out in full view. There's a fashion parade in the devil's cave. To paraphrase Harry Truman, if you can't stand the overflowing toilets, get out of the bathroom. Washington is a land of insanity, psychosis, spying, panic, and excrement throwing. When you try to connect the dots, you see they have blood and lies and hatred and coup plotting and impeachment and even the ghosts of David Rockefeller and Benning in them as opening and closing little clam, clams and sharks and crawling worms and blobs of unidentified species trying to take Donald Trump down. And he, of course, wants to take them down. It would be no surprise if the people would hold each other's secrets at staring at a nuclear freeze packed of a, of a of the bargaining table, you can't blow me up without me blowing you up. Also consider players within the U.S. intelligence community. Both CIA and NSA have been spying on officials in Washington and other prominent Americans for a long time. These agencies hold secrets as well. And there is an organization whose numbers and alumni Trump has surrounded himself with Goldman Sachs. Through his key appointees from the vampire squid firm, Trump is working an audacious angle. He knows that if the stock market takes a long and horrendous dive, the pressure on him is going to be enormous. The business community will blame him. The media will claim the economy is collapsing under his watch. Goldman can take many moves to keep the stock market up. What does the firm want in return? That's the magic question. The threats of war and war in order to keep contract money flowing to the military industrial complex, a special and undetectable favors, protections 
from, pro from prosecution from ongoing financial crimes? And what does Goldman Sachs know about Trump? What would they be willing to reveal? Willing to reveal if he backs away from any part of the agreement he has struck with them? The mutually assured destruction pact has more than two sides. Holding together a multifaceted truce isn't the easiest job in the world. Everyone involved has something to gain and something to lose. Calculating upside and downside is a delicate proposition. And in the midst of this crazy people can show up who go off on the spur of the moment. They blow their corks and all bets are off. Now for cooler heads are prevailing. For now, cooler heads are prevailing. For now. Mark, um, blackmail, extortion is not the only game in town, but it is the big one. It lurks around every corner and sits in every conference room. It weaves its way through legislation, policy, and judicial decision. It's the other branch of government. Interesting, I would say, my friends. That's a real good um, synopsis on that. And the whole thing, like I said, is that all it is is a cloak and dagger cloak and dagger uh, perception. I've been telling this from the very beginning. It's going to be a cloak and dagger uh, environment during Trump's presidency. So, who has the upper hand as of yet? So, expect more of this. And like I said about the economy once again, you're going to blame it on Trump. Like him or not, don't buy it. Because it would be unmeritable. It's been going on for a very long time. So, um, <laughs> we'll see how the chips will fall on this one, right? Okay. Now, next one here. Came from, actually came from Moon of Alabama. I got this from uh, Blacklisted News. You know, yeah, the, uh, Doug Owens, he's good at collecting information on uh, uh, multiple links. I was having a shot of coffee. All right. This one here is entitled Syria True Slips Through Through in the New York Times NATO Preps to Fight Iran and Russia. New York Times has an interesting piece about East Aleppo. Robert Worth visited in a recent, re, recently and talked to people there. The NYT editors and censors inserted many other standard slander against the Syrian government, but the can but cannot drown out the realities described therein. Thus, this, the piece is headlined, Aleppo after the fall, but one of the key sentences in it says just the opposite. Yasser said he was one of the first people to come back to East Aleppo right after what he, like everyone else, I met called the liberation. Jihadi propaganda claims of government bombing of random hospitals without reason verified by a scant call to some... Al Qaeda propagandists in Idlib are mixed with reality based on the ground reporting. On my second day in the city, I went to see the Aleppo Eye Hospital, a sprawling compound that the rebels had used as a military headquarters. As we walked through the burned and shattered building, my government minder and the soldiers guarding the place kept picking up markers of the rebels' Islamist leanings. They were aren't they weren't hard to find. A far black car out front still had, had the Akata logo on its hood. Unfortunately, the piece also includes a factual errors. Reporter and Aleppo uh, named Rida, Rida, Rida Al Bashad described the neighbors where looting had taken place and named the militia, including the notorious Tiger forces, whose leaders included well known thugs. No, I don't doubt that looting has taken place after the liberation of East Aleppo. Those who support the rebel invasion of their city will have lost everything but looting by the Tiger Force militia. The Tiger Force are the Special Operations Division of the Syrian Arab Army, now militia. It is led by highly professional officers, not by thugs. It is leader General Sh Shihil Al Hassan and has been in the army for 20 over 26 years. The division is armed with Russia T90 tanks 
and other heavy assault equipment. It is an off offensive unit that has been very busy on various fronts. It is not moping up or occupation force for the urban areas that would have time for organizing and looting in Aleppo. The quoted claim is inconsistent with those facts, but still, the magazine piece is filled with detailed story of real people who act factually tell what the rebels have done to their city. They, how they looted every factory and every house through the copper electric, electricity wire and sold everything off to Turkey. Whenever the story is based on real reporting, it confirms the view and positions of the anti-Islamist Syrian majority, which supports its government. After years of claiming the opposite in its hundreds of of anti-Syrian propaganda piece, one wonder how the NYT editors let this pass. One antidote, right, antidote, anecdote, even reveals who the Syrians will choose as their future leader. My Syrian businessman friend told me that he twice gathered about a dozen people for dinner, then offered them a hypothetical and strict confidence. It's up to you to name the next president of Syria, he said. Whom would you choose? Guess were all, the guests were all Syrians non, and none support the regime. To his surprise, almost all of them named Assad. And that, dear reader, is why the U.S. and its proxies are against truly democratic elections in, in Syria. The nemesis would easily win and prevent the planned neoliberal looting of what is left of the Syrian state. The Islamic proxy forces of the West, Al-Qaeda under its various disguises, al al sham and even ISIS are mostly done. The latest especially is no longer a capable military force, but is reverting to guerrilla levels of operation. Its final defeat will take a long time, but it must and will be achieved by local forces. Despite that the U.S. pressed on NATO members to let the NATO organization join its fight against ISIS, the single NATO members were already part of the U.S. coalition, but NATO as an organization brings large-scale commands and control capabilities as well as additional forces all under U.S. control. Make no mistake. Fighting ISIS is not the real purpose of the move. They want us NATO support to invade Syria from the from the north and El Deb as well as from the near south near Daria and from the southeast starting at the Al Tan border station to Iraq. Syria and its allies now c can be fought under the disguise of the fighting ISIS, which factually can no longer be the purpose. Thus, NATO together. With Wahhabi Gulf forces will not be engaged in an expanded war, not only against the Syrian government, but especially against its Russian and Iranian allies. Trump's endorsement of anti-Iranian rhetoric on his visit to Saudi Arabia served a similar purpose. A, a Syrians and his allies will try to prevent a further invasion by cutting off Al Tap on holding on to the Rhea city, thereby blocking any wider military forces. But those measures will probably be in vain unless some sane forces intervene. We are now at the beginning of a far wider, more dangerous war that can easily slip out of anyone's control. And this is why I will have to say this is butt out. Of Syria and Iran and all that. Even if Donald Trump wants to act like he should oh, go attack Iran. You know what? Y'all want your big fat ass down there. Excuse my language. But that's how I have to see it. I don't give a damn who this person is. He's just an example. Him and his lackeys and everyone else. I want them on the front line of battle. Let's see how tough they are. People are sick and tired. Of this. It's called war fatigue. People are tired of it, man. Stop lying to the American people. It's not working anymore. Why are you going to continue the imperialism? Empire. Well, you always sold your behind say one word order once again. So I can tell this. I think the United States need to get out of NATO, the United Nations, and become a republic once again, not some pretentious empire because it's downright unacceptable. People are getting ripped off, extorted. 
All you folks out there, I know, yeah, you got your bunch of zombies out there, but many of them aren't. They're seeing the bigger picture. And screw all this distraction, garbage, counterfeit news, and lame stream media. Start looking at the bigger picture. Leave the people in Syria alone. Let them decide what they want. I'm not a sod lover. But you know what? That's the people's call. And I've been saying it for a good period of time. All right. Next one here came from Mass Private, Private, Private Eye, the blog. And it, said, and it came out yesterday. They say transit police are secretly are secretly spying on commuters, travel plans, texts, and emails. There's a thing called BART Watch here. A class action lawsuit in California reveals that transit police are using free BART Watch app and stingray surveillance to secretly spy on commuters, texts, and emails. And uh, a lot of, you can look at the pages there yourself. Transit police taking their cues from other police departments claiming their only interest in public safety and security. I see 1984 Aurelian style. Safety and security is our top priority. Bart Watch allows you to quickly and discreetly report crimes uh, or suspicious activity directly to Bart Police. And there's a video on here as well. You can see it for yourselves. According to ABC 7 News, at least 10,000 10, to 15,000 people have downloaded the eAlert spying app. The lawsuit reveals that transit police are using e-alerts to sickly collect ev- um, everyone's cell phone identification number, otherwise known as International Mo- Mobile Equipment Identity Number, or IMEI. While BARTs and e represent that the app is a discreet way of reporting issues, the, def- the, def- the de- defendants actually programmed the app to secretly collect transit users' unique cellular identifiers periodically monitor users' location and track the identities of anonymous reporters, the lawsuit claims. The lawsuit warns that transit police also use stingray surveillance to identify individuals and spy on their texts and emails. To make it easier to spy on commuters, eAlerts wants transit police to use their new free text a tip app. The app can be branded with our transit system logo and works with iPhones and Android smartphones. A convenient drop-down menu makes it easy for riders to indicate report types such as assault, robbery, medical emergency, or suspicious activities. Yeah, so if you're having a beer in your hand, oh, you're a suspicious guy being alcoholic. Transit police across country are spying on commuters. The BART Watch Surveillance app is made by Ehlers Corporation, who claim that the number one incident reporting and learning app in the country. They also claim that 12 transit police departments are using their app, which means there are at least 12 transit police departments spying on commuters. According to an article in the Boston Business Journal, Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, MBTA, has been using Ehlers to spy on commuters since 2012. Sneaky transit police across the country encourage commuters to download free versions to see something, say something, app. Well, it didn't work for Boston bombing, right? So supposedly. Ehlers, MBTA, there's a video on that. Um, transit police use commuters to fear terrorism to get them to download their apps. Transit police are always looking for new tools to empower riders and keep the system safe, said MBTA Transit Police Paul Chief McMillan. Two years ago, I warned everyone that has public transportation commuters are being spied on billions of times a day, but things have gotten worse. Cops admit to spying on commuters' travel plans. Two days ago, the, Se- the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in favor of Galesburg cop and DEA officer named Mings, who, like a good little bundist, goes every day to the Amtrak station studying the travel plans of passengers. Mings admitted that he targeted a woman who had been arrested more than several Seven years ago, for marijuana possession. <gasps> Run to the hills! Means also admitted he didn't know whether the arrest had led to prosecution, conviction, or punishment, but he still singled her out. And law enforcement says it doesn't matter if you've been arrested 30, 20, or 7 years ago, you're still a criminal. I recommend everyone read the appeals court ruling to, sit, to, to see how police claim intimidation can't, isn't, cohesion, and much more. 
DHS, VPR, the Viper teams work closely to transit cops across the country. Oh, excuse me here. Oh, sorry here. Oops. Yeah, that this past March, the Minneapolis Metro Transit Police admitted they've been working with the DHS Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response VIP Viper teams for more than a decade. Viper teams are meant to intimidate commuters and allow them to search people without a warrant, as the story from Chicago reveals. Um, Abby says, said Viper teams were conducting random bag checks. They were standing in a row against the wall with the ticket machines, said said. I did not single out the CBT officer in the line. They all have visible Homeland Security credentials. <laughs> oh, I can dream about it. A police state will make me feel safe. A few days ago, another Metro Transit cop, Minneapolis Metro Transit cop, was videotaped asking commuters to ask about their immigration status. Do you feel safer? Knowing police across the country are targeting and spying on commuters. For more information about America's secret railroad police breed, Mer- Police State America's National Railroad Police. To find out more on the Viper teams, click here and here. Yes, yeah, so how you feel to be safe? I'll give up my freedom for security. 9-11 made me think to have nannies to wipe my ass. Exactly. If this is how they want to use it, they're going to make an excuse. The 24-7 excuse is September 11, 2001. Won't you get it, folks? Can you all say, all hold hands in solidarity saying, God bless the new world order. Tyranny is the only way. Is how what they want you to believe. The fear factor. The mind control. The you folks you want us to be dumb, standing happy and go, yes, master, may I have another? If they say bend over, you go, how far, please? Truth, justice, and the good two shoes way will get me ahead in life. Yep, and it will make you become an eternal doormat. Imagine you, you go out trying to meet someone go, hi, I get trade it out. I get step in by the, by the system. Does that turn you on? They're going to look at you like, what's your beef? And so, me got to get these slobs that only eat donuts and only have coffee all the time and, and think they're all tough because they have these credentials. They're not constant. They, lo- they, they, they lose their conscience. Oh, I'm just doing my job. Please. You're just another Uncle Tom if you're going to have those attributes or Angel Mama. Stop it. You guys got a lot more power than what those clowns want you to believe. That's right. So all you folks out there, better listen up and think before you do. Because one thing for sure, you got the grasp to make things happen, not some governmental delegates. And I'll be right back. Yeah, I had to watch that um, actual glimpse of that video that uh, Minneapolis police was trying to tell the guy, are you legally in here? Actually, someone intervened, go, are you a federal agent? I'm just paraphrasing. Oh, not necessarily. So I told him to stay, so back off. And he actually did. He's been being videotaped. That's how you got to do it, folks. If, they, if they're asking you questions, they're investigating you. You don't have to say a confounded word to them, period. That's what an example of vigilance is all about. Okay, I'm going to do one more here. I know... This came from Blitz Creek and uh, by Michael Krieger. Came out yesterday. A new financial system is being born. If Bitcoin blew away when you first discovered it, it continued to do so this day. Special dynamics can help explain why. Bitcoin was an expression in the physical world of the newly emergent, leading edge, integral level consciousness. It drew lessons from history and attempted to take the best orange and green worldviews and incorporated them to an entirely new form of money. We can see clear presence of free markets and individualism as well as international separation for the system from denominator hierarchies, bureaucratic government meddling, which had all corrupted all money before that. Its greenness is evident in the fact by that by design, no individual or company controls the network. Global decentralized revolution technology. This is perhaps a perfect example of integral consciousness operating on our planet at this time. 
from an economic standpoint and why it has captured the imagination of so many and while at the same time being violently rejected by so by so many others. From a February post, why consciousness is the only path forward. Although I heard about about it much earlier, I didn't truly start investigating Bitcoin until the summer of twenty twelve. The more I learned the more I learned, the more my mind was blown away, and for a while I couldn't think about anything else. What's truly solidified is a real-world usefulness to me when I discovered it has been used by WikiLeaks to accept payments in the midst of financial services blockades against the renegade publisher. This realization inspired my first Bitcoin-related post in August 2012, Bitcoin, a way to fight back against the financial terrorists. So there's links on here you can see you read for yourself. In that piece, I linked to a Forbes article the detail of the revolutionary events taking place. We learned following a massive release of secret U.S. diplomatic cables in November 2012, donations to WikiLeaks were blocked. And, there, and there's, there's a link for that. Fortunately, there's a way around this and other financial blockages or global payments methods immune to public pressure and monetary censorship. On its public Bitcoin address, there's a, there's a link for that too. I knew right then and there that Bitcoin had potent, that a potential change the world. My passion for Bitcoin was, al- was always framed by 10 years working in the financial industry. Many of us who lived through 2008 crisis knew the financial system was dead. We knew it was corrupt, arrogant, archaic, and terminal. So many of us began bracing for what might come next. We, what we, we did, we thought made sense at the time, which included buying precious metals like gold, silver, and given the historic track record of protecting wealth in periods of paradigm-shifting financial disruption. Others took more extreme measures to protect themselves by the, inter- the end of the financial system, but a small group forward then ge- thinking geeks decided to do, do something much better. They decided to build an alternative. Thus, Bitcoin was born and early adopters in the field of technology immediately began to build up on top of it. As soon as I realized what was happening, much of the doom and gloom, that, that had enveloped my thinking began to lift. I knew that even if the financial system crashed and, and burned tomorrow, the early stages of a new and far more honest financial system were already in place. The emergence of Bitcoin literally changed my life for the better and has allowed me to emerge from a cave of gloom and become optimistic about our long-term future. While I knew the path would be long and hard since the current entrenched interests were given up without a fight, I could see a very bright light at the end of the tunnel, and the continued development in this space has been extraordinary to watch ever since. The global financial system, as it stands completely arrogant and corrupt, and it wrenches the wrong types of people for the wrong sort of behavior, and it's entirely extractive and parasitic by design. If there is a sector in the economy that needs a total redesign and reboot for the sake of humanity, it's the financial system. Being involved in the crypto system for the past five years has been a breath of fresh air and a shot of adrenaline to my system. Traditional markets are a rigged snooze fest by comparison to grotesque financial Potemkin villages designed to make overly in-depth predatory econ- econ- economies look good. What I find so fascinating about the current environment is that many of the dreams we all read about in the early days of Bitcoin are starting to be implemented and designed slowly but surely for those who still have difficult time conceptualizing exactly what's happening in the space, I think the following tweet may help. If you think crypto coin as a beginning of an entirely new financial system and architect, it, it makes a lot more sense. As, as he did this on May, tw- on May 24th. On that note, I want to talk about more than just Bitcoin. I, I see, which I see as a rever- reverse reserve currency of the crypto world. Beyond crypt- Bitcoin, a lot of buzz right now got involved now revolves around burgoing phenomenon known as ICOs or initial coin offerings. So what are ICOs? It's Telecrunch. You can see that for yourself. Because this editor was still confused. I'm not proud. I talked yesterday with Stan Maroshik, a UC Berkeley grad with a BA from MIT who today runs LA-based Oregon Group, one of the first digital finance-focused investment banks. Merrill Shank nicely answered with an array of questions about ICOs, including how, about how these things get staged, how companies establish a value for their offerings, and more. If you're still trying to get a handle of this latest investing trend, to read on. And says, is the question, ICOs are everywhere suddenly. 
when are the when are the when was the first ICO stage? He says here. A lot of questions and answers here. Yeah, it's gonna. Yeah, why not? I'll just read this along. And SM said, you have to go back to the to around 2013 when Mastercoin, a protocol on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, raised five hundred thousand dollars. Then you had a number of other milestones, tech token sales such as Ethereum in 2014. Then the the DAO, the decentralized autonomous organization, which was built on the Ethereum blockchain that stored the transmitted Ether. Et- Ether and Ethereum based assets and that raised the equivalent of $150 million last year. Momentum began to build after that. A smaller group of these offerings grew in size and by last fall some companies were raising millions of dollars in minutes. They were kind of made people stand up and wondering if this is a new funding mechanism. And the question here how many ICOs have been there to, been to date? And he, he said, SM said there were 64 last year that collectively raised $103 million including Dayo. So far this year, we've seen 25 offerings raise a bit more than $163 million, and we're on track to see more than $210 million raised by the end of June. So how do these ICO works, particularly speaking? As some said, there's, a can- there's candidates to these things. You do the prep work, and you get your project to a natural technical milestone. Then you pre-announce when you're planning to have a token sale, describing some of the terms and telling a story of the project and its goals. You publish a white paper and disclosure to give people a chance to read it and comment. There are also usually threads that develop on Reddit, Bitcoin Talk, Slack, Telegram, and elsewhere where people actively debate the merits of the product. Then on the landing page and the after aforementioned date, there's typically a tool that enables purchasers to acquire the tokens in exchange for Bitcoin for or either. TC said, is there a concern that U.S. regulators will crack down on these ICOs? SM lawyers are relying on case law that defines what, secu- what security is. The best well-known security case is how we, how we test, created by the Supreme Court for determining whether certain transactions qualify as investment contracts. If they do, then those, con- those transactions are considered securities and are subject to certain disclosure and registration requirements. When tokens are structured basically as a sales of a service or product, they're designed to make sure various prongs tests are not triggered. TC, what types of companies are primarily using ICOs? As Sam says, it's, all, it's still all financing mechanisms that's very organic to the blockchain community. And it's all started with protocols like Ethereum raising funding through this mechanism, and it has stayed close to retail projects like distributed storage company, Stajori, and Civic, a company that provides identified through the blockchain and is announcing its token sale this, this Thursday. A lot of these founders have token buyers are part of the Bitcoin forums and re-edit, and that's why certain companies are able to raise these large sums fairly quickly they, they're, they're reaching out for the, to thought leaders and getting their support and generating buzz about their projects. It's basically open source community now with an open source funding mechanism. TC, what's happening when people want to sell the tokens they bought? The SM goes, well, first, you can use them in the company ecosystem. When storage is made, maybe you buy storage. You can also accumulate those these tokens over time as a bet with more enterprise demand for storage capacity the coins will become more valuable after which you can sell your tokens to someone else who needs to purchase storage space there are also a number of cryptocurrency exchanges where the tokens trade in the case storage can you can sell or buy Polynix and they or, or bitrex tc says should you should VCs be nervous about CEOs, ICOs? You mentioned Civic, which is staging an ICO. Civic also raised some venture capital previously, but plenty of other companies seem to be skipping the VC part. SM, to some degree, they should, but we've also talked with a lot of very smart VCs who are looking at this space, including August Capital, Tim and Adam Draper, Blockchain Capital. Many doing the work to understand how to be involved and active in the space and the fundamental value of these protocols, Union Square Ventures has said it has now now has a mandate from its LPs to hold these assets. For companies that raises 
funds through token sale and that have a traditional a angel or venture rounds previously. For example, there are equity investors who skip one or two rounds of dilution, which is great. It means their returns are hyper lubbered. There are two points I want to emphasize from the above. First, just how early we are in development on this of this area. Numbers are absolutely tiny at this point, despite all the hype. Recall that in 2017, we've seen 25 offerings raise a bit more than $163 million. They are infin- an ooh, infamously small number in a scheme of things, and thus room for growth is massive. That being said, people are considering getting involved in this space as a buyer of ICOs need to be extraordinarily careful. Investing in general and risky is ch- and challenging, but putting money into an ICO adds several other layers of complexity at risk. Risk First, at notice, above these things are not equity investments since they w- aren't allowed to be under current regulations. Therefore, you're not simply investing in a startup, which is always extremely risky, but you're making a bet that the token itself is useful and will occur in value over time. Therefore, not only do you need to be right about the success of the business or product itself, but the token also must have real value, creating purpose to succeed in the long run. Many people will not understand this, and they think they're buying into equity of underlying businesses, which is which sets up a perfect environment for fraudsters. You really need to bear in mind there's a ton of Bitcoin illiquidity that is flooding around the space given the massive run it has. Most early Bitcoin adapters and investors are very passionate and dedicated to the space. They want they don't want to sell coins for dollars, but want to put it in new projects to keep the broader ecosystem growing. I think this is a fantastic thing, but it also means there's only, there's a lot of cryptocurrency sloshing around time trying to find a home. Despite the risk, I think emergence of the growing, the growing token market is a game changing the extraordinarily empowering development. The only thing preventing the crypto coin world from rapidly displacing the middleman and bureaucrats of the traditional financial system are the bearers around the traditional financial world. We, while we like to think these barriers are there to, to protect little, the little people, we all know that the SEC and other such regulatory bodies largely exist to protect the rich and powerful and secure their moat. We, un- we saw this under Obama's Mary Jo White, and we surely see it under his Trump pick, Jay Clayton. This seemed to have all sorts of conflicts, including the wife who works at Goldman Sachs. The SEC doesn't protect the people, but as long as it pretends to, it can continue to function as a gatekeeper for the financial oligarchs and slow down the pace of displacement of the dying financial system with a new peril one currently being created. All that is fine, I suppose, and the innovation in the crypto world will continue until one day we'll actually see equity offerings and startups to regular people as opposed to just allocations to the wealthiest clients and brokerage firms. The innovation in this space has the potential to flatten the world of investing in a meaningful and powerful way, starting today with tokens, but ultimately in many other ways as well. It's going to take time, but it'll happen. At this point, I just want to briefly address the common retort that governments will never let this happen, which I get all the time. Here's what I had to say about it yesterday on Twitter, and I don't really have much to say beyond this. They didn't, they did not. They didn't want to let go on information control either, but the printing press and internet still happen. And I like what uh, Barack Obama says: cryptocurrency will not take off because no government will support it. Cannot go to signal to, signal rage and monetary policy control. Well, I have to say this to him, my friend. With no all due respect, there's a lot of things you can do. Stop being a yes man and think a lot broader. Stop being controlled by these clowns called government. And I'll continue on here. To conclude, I'd like to dedicate this post to all brilliant geeks and dynamic entrepreneurs pushing hard every day to realize this incredible dream of a decentralized future. A future that breaks down barriers, removes middlemen, and empowers humanity to take its evolutionary leap forward. You are the ones creating this brand new world brimming with potential and optimism. I want to thank you all you have done to continue to do so. And like I said, like, 
this whole cryptocurrency. As long as the bureaucrats and government and banks don't get involved, if they're angry, then it has to be good. But I'll never, always say this. Don't follow the hype. Never leave all your eggs in one basket. I do support, um, um, what is it? Commodities, gold, silver, metals, and all that. And this is just an example why we got decentralized the Federal Reserve in the United States and other central banks around the world, World Bank and IMF. We got to say, we got to tell them to stick it. Because that's what they want to do. They want us to be their slaves. And now with something like this, it was a great example. It can enhance humanity a lot further. This is an example of demoniac resistance. And you can add, too, I'm excited as well. Like a lot of states want to use gold and silver as transactions and even produce it. You can get gold and silver in the, in the, United, in, in the, in the states because it's guaranteed under Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution. The states can produce money. Along with gold and silver coins. I don't hear, eh, it's not going to happen. You know why? People with that attitude can't do a damn thing. They're one of those crybabies. They complain. They bend over and, and, and go, yes, master, can have another. Never, ever use that mindset. Because you're part of the problem, not the solution. So you know what? The areas of that, a cryptocurrency, as long as it's not regulated, as long as it's not being banks through control, I like it. And you know what? People should take the initiative to put some of this money in, not leave it all in one basket, but give it a little shot. Life's a gamble. Give it a little shot. Hey, I know how it's investing in stocks. And I got, you know, I got, I got, it sank. But you know what? I'm not crying about it. What doesn't kill you make you stronger, right? That's what Frederick Nietzsche has to say. And I, I don't know if that's not a stupid song either, okay? <laughs> all right, my friends. That is all for now. I'd like to thank everyone for listening plus feel free and download feel free to download and share this throughout your social media networks if you have any questions comments or you want to send me something that's interesting i might want to check out whatever you do please send your correspondences with decor you can hit me on facebook twitter google plus spreaker iheart radio tumblr youtube scene.life Minds.com, Freedoms Network, Future Club, FutureNet.club, and Patreon.com slash look, forward slash Lucky Luck 3, which is three eyes. Or you can email me at Lucky Luck 3, which is Lucky Luck 3 all together at gmail.com. Or you can encrypt the types, Lucky Luck 03 at ProtonMail.com. All right, well, I decided to play a song. Yeah, it's been a while. And a um, band um, called Anger the Gods. And I heard about them a while back. I had some friends, of, one of my friends of mine in the band, uh, Randall McMillan. I knew him for over 24 years. Good, good, good chat. Great guitar player. And uh, it was funny because I was chatting with their vocalist last night at Churchill's, uh, Cole. Hope you're doing well, my friend. It's great to talk to you. And I have to say, is, um, you know, it's really cool. So that's how I play a song for them and to the fans out there. It's easy about the band uh, Anger the Gods. They're considered to be a metal band. So here, Anger the Gods is a progressive metal band that combines old and new school influences to create a unique sound. The members of the band are still from South Florida. We combine elements of metal, hardcore, and progressive rock with slick melodies, slick melodies that keep you hooked. Influences range from bands like Slayer, Testament, Obituary, to newer bands like Chimeria, Unearth, and all that remains. With the addition of the newest members, we now have a complex sound that we've been searching for. Anger the Gods is ready to make a name for themselves and breathe new life into the metal scene of South Florida. And if I recall, this song came out called Lost, and it came, it came out like a while back. But it's pretty cool. It's more like a semi ballad, I would say. But I'll definitely play it for you. Check it out. And that's it. So, once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading love. And may your guardian spirits be with you. Mm-hmm.